Media. Today is March 20th, 2022, and we have a very special guest on the show today, John Kane. John Kane is a Mohawk activist and, and an educator, producer, and host of the Let's Talk Native podcast and co-host of Resistance Radio on WBAI Pacific Radio, New York. Um, John, thank you so much for coming on the show today and welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I do want to note, though, um, Resistance Radio is also on WPFW in Washington, D.C. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, well, a few months ago, we had Tierney Cherie on our show to discuss her research and book on the racist and genocidal history um, and present of the child welfare system, and which activists today are now more accurately referring to as the family policing system. Uh, one of the thing, one thing that was clear from Tierney's book um, and research, and that of many others, is that Indigenous children and families have been the most profoundly impacted and targeted by not just the settler colonialists of the past, but that this genocidal campaign continues today. I was wondering what, what your thoughts are on this topic. Well, one thing that, that I think is important to note is that any actions against children it, in, in our culture are also actions against women because we, most of us, and, and I speak, you know, as a, uh, as Haudenosaunee, um, uh, as Gunyagahaga, as and 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 for many of our native territories, we have matrilineal societies, and that means the women have a specific role in perpetuating who we are. I mean, it's it's not just as simple as saying, "Well, you get your nationhood and your clan designation from uh, from your mother." It's more than that. You, um, we, um. Everything about our culture is is handed down through the women. So when you strip, when you first off condemn women as being somehow unfit mothers, or and and that that applies to both the residential schools, um, foster care, and and adoption systems that that have done that. When you condemn our women as somehow deficient in their ability to um, to raise children, for one thing, you're not just condemning the mothers; you're condemning the the women's societies in general. So the the profound loss isn't just the loss of 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 parenting skills. It's it's a it's a profound loss that that is impacted on children uh, and and the women who who whose responsibility has been ripped away from them. The rights and responsibilities I might add. Um that's what's so profound about it. It it is you know you, you and, and think about this residential schools existed for a hundred years and the foster care and adoption system, frankly, it, it's still in, uh, in tatters today. I mean, it, it hasn't been fixed. I mean, there's, there's been attempts at, at, at doing some things to, to impact it, but you know, we, it's still profoundly broken. Um, and it continues to be problematic because we as indigenous people and, and our families, we live on either side of the, of the U.S. Canadian border, you know, and, and for and for Native people on the southern border, it's probably the same thing. But as a, as a Mohawk or Gunyagahaga, I can say we know that that Canadian U.S. border impacts even um, some of the things that have been attempted, you know, to to prevent some of the ripping away of children from uh, from Native families, from Native communities and from and from their nations. Um, and I also, you know, wanted to talk about Canada in the sense that it seems like every few months we learn of another mass grave found on the grounds of former residential schools for Indigenous children. Um, and the fact that we aren't hearing about similar discoveries in the U.S., does that mean that the settler colonists of the U.S. were somehow more humane towards Indigenous children? Uh, no, it actually means that they've been uh, keeping their... Um, crimes their atrocities buried for a longer period of time you know look out of on the canadian side there there's like 139 residential schools that that, that were in operation the 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 10,000 children that have been discovered in you know through ground penetrating radar and and various other means uh buried at 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 schools that's only been for 11 schools i mean there's still over 100 schools there's still you know 100 uh, you know 100 and 28 schools left on the u.s side 
there were three times as many residential schools. And we know that uh, that children died in all of those schools. In fact, the mo um, among the most famous schools was Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. And they had over 200 marked graves. Of course, some of them were marked with names like unknown because somehow you could have children in a school that that have that re were able to remain nameless and then died nameless as far as the uh, the Carlisle Indian schools go. But the other thing we know about Carlisle is that because of the uh, the model that it was attempting to be in this kill the Indian, save the man policy that but that the U.S. led and and ultimately was adopted in Canada. Australia, New Zealand, you know, throughout Africa and, and South America as well. Um, because they were the model, they tried to manage the image of children dying in their school. So what what was attempted was when it, when a child did become ill, especially terminally, terminally ill, those children, there was an attempt to send those kids um, home so they would die um, not at the school, but they would die, you know, um, under their, their so-called parents' care. The, I mean, the interesting thing is, on the Canadian side, they wouldn't, they wouldn't send the kids home, even the diet home, because they didn't want to spend the money. So that's why you have so many of these unmarked, if not mass graves, uh, on the Canadian side. But, you know, when all of the schools are investigated, if that ever really happens, you're going to find, you know, look... I think it's likely you're going to you're going to find you know 30 40,000 um you know maybe 50,000 children that died at these schools on the Canadian side and I think you're going to find at least double that amount on the on on the US side but you know what you know I think trying to concentrate solely on children who died I mean and when I say died I mean completely died I mean whose whose lives ended there does a disservice to to all those children that had a part of them killed, all of them who had a part of them killed, because that was the policy. I mean, that was that was the that was the strategy. Kill the Indian. It was about killing a part of every child there, to to not just damage the children and not just assimilate and indoctrinate the children, but to, there was a bigger goal there, and, and the bigger goal was to eliminate us as, as people. We experienced the largest period of land loss during that hundred years of residential schools. The largest period of land, um, the largest period of land loss, and the most, the, I mean, and the largest extent of land loss took place during that during that period. We also lost our identity, our sovereignty, our distinction. So, yes, these schools represented crimes against humanity. They they did represent atrocities committed against individuals, but that's not what their their, their design was to was to eliminate us. It was to it was to uh, it, it was to commit genocide. Mm. So. And you know, and you look, know, there's five things that deter that that determine genocide. Any one of which determine genocide, and, and one of them is is killing um, people. One of them is con is uh, inflicting bodily psych or psychological, and of course that includes sexual uh, abuse and crimes against people. The other one is to um, just to generally create the conditions by which a people would cease to exist as a result of, of, of clear policies. And, you know, so that includes what some people want to call cultural genocide, which is frankly a BS term. There's no such thing as cultural genocide. There's either genocide or there's not genocide. And then the, uh, an another one of the, uh, of the, of the international standards for genocide is, um, um, is, is somehow reducing the ability to, to reproduce. So sterilization. And of course, the fifth is taking children. Residential schools represent all five of the international standards that you know that make up um, the, what is now the international crime known as genocide. All five of them. So it isn't just you know that that the our, the hair was cut or that the language was forbidden. It was it was much more than that. And 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 I think it's problematic if we only look at this as crimes against individual children and not look at it as the genocide committed against peoples, you know, and, and all of our peoples, because look on the Canadian side, when they went through their truth and reconciliation commission, which they, they failed to, to even adopt many of the, uh, the, uh, the action items that came out of that truth and reconciliation commission, they did write checks. So they wrote checks to, to survivors of, uh, and the families of survivors of, of residential schools, but they didn't return land. 
Mm-hmm. They didn't. They didn't um, acknowledge or recognize our autonomy and our distinction. So, so essentially, if if we only accept some sort of cash payment, or, you know, or some reparation to to attain reconciliation out of these things, if we don't address the land loss and the autonomy and distinction loss, then what we're saying is, yeah, that was okay. That part's okay, but we but we still need to hold you accountable for what you did to individual children. And I'm sorry, we don't need reconciliation. We need restoration. We need restoration of land. And and look, and I'm not saying we're going to get all of our land back, but we need to, to be restored in terms of place. And some of that is going to recall, require lands uh, being restored, but some of it's just going to be, a, is going to require that we be allowed to have space you know, in, in, in media, in schools, in, mm-hmm. in theater, in, in, you know, so it's not just, you know, the idea that, that these are public um, um, spaces that we need to be in. Some of this might be, uh, you know, across the board. We need to be accommodated for the, for the spaces that we were taken out of. I mean, and this, and this, frankly, this gets into the mascot issue. I mean, I think mm-hmm. about these white schools adopting these nat- this native imagery and then claiming that identity, you, you got white people saying, "Oh, I'm an Indian. I'm an Indian. I, my my mother was an Indian, and so I'm an Indian, and I'll be an Indian for life," just because that's the mascot that the the Jew, their 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 school had selected. I mean, and they do this without ever teaching Native history. So they grab mm-hmm. an identity, they call it their own, and and it essentially is identity theft. But there's an absence of us having space. They never examined, well, where did the real native people that we're claiming to call ourselves go? Where did they go? And why did they go? Mm-hmm. So so I think there's a, a, a bigger and more important objective that's got to be, um, you know, geared towards or strive for beyond, you know, reconciliation. When you look it up online and it says the restoration of friendly relations. Well, I'm not sure that we ever had friendly relations. So what are we what are we restoring? I'll tell you what we should be restoring. Land and autonomy. Mm-hmm. So you're telling me Thanksgiving was a myth? <laughs> no, I don't need to tell you that. The history books will tell you that. I mean, I, honestly, the first proclaimed Thanksgiving was um, where the Puritan communities proclaiming a Thanksgiving for having killed, you know, a, a, you know, the native people that they that they and slaughtered. I mean, they actually took um, Metacom's head off, and he was a 12 year old chief, I guess, and they took his head off and they put it on a stick. So I mean, this is you know. I mean, yeah, that was that. That was the first proclaimed Thanksgiving. Abraham Lincoln would would uh, proclaim a national holiday called Thanksgiving uh, later on, but it really had nothing to do with us. I mean, mm. that they, yeah, that story, like the Pocahontas story, and so many of the other stories, were just made up. I mean, it was just made up to, you know, frankly, because look, you know, people love stories, and you know, and, they, and they like to, you know, create these. Um, myths that um, you know that satisfy their own sense of history and place. And and look, if you can suggest that somehow Native people just willingly gave up our lands <laughs> and fed, fed the uh, the colonists that I mean, because we were we were so grateful to see them, um, and you know and, and saved John Smith's life, and you make up all of these stories about how willing we were to allow a country to be um, born on our homeland, you know, that makes everybody feel good. Mm. Yeah. And, and staying on this topic a little bit more of, of the family policing system, um, can you tell us um, what the Indian Child Welfare Act is, ICWA, and what does it mean that it is being challenged at the, Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court? Well, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm a little surprised the challenge didn't come sooner because, you know, here's, here's the problem with ICWA. The problem is that ICWA, you know, the Indian Child Welfare Act doesn't give us the authority over our children. It just asserts that the federal government can prevent the states from taking, um, you know, taking control and, and uh, of placement of, of Native children. And that becomes a fight, you know, like like many fights in the United States between states' rights and uh, and the rights of, of federal government. We see this playing out. You know, in election laws, we see this playing out over abortion. We see it playing out in, over so many other issues. And in this case, you know, the, the states are saying the federal government is, is overreaching to say that they can um, determine where a child is being placed. Because 
again, ICWA fails to, to recognize our sovereignty, getting back to that whole restoration of autonomy. If, if, if the Indian Child Welfare Act just clearly stated that native territories in the nations, you know, where these children are being, you know, ripped from, um, that they have the authority, but it, it doesn't quite do that. So, look, I'm not surprised that states like Texas or Louisiana would, would, ch would be challenging this law because they, you know, this is, you know, this is that whole right wing agenda to, you know, to try to make sure that that national policy is dictated by the right, uh, you know, by red states. And, and that's, you know, and that's what's happening here. I mean, look, I'm not sure that, that um, many of these red states would be opposed uh, to the federal government asserting more power, as long as it was asserting it in a way that was consistent with their, philo you know, their, their ideologies and philosophy. So um, look, I, I won't say that ICWA didn't have some benefits. It did. I mean, it did stop in many ways, but not completely. In many ways, the abusive relationship between uh, child services, um, state child, state and county child services, um, and native communities. I mean, it, and and in many ways, that relationship improved under the Indian Child Welfare Act. But in any place, in any state that you have uh, uh, you know, this level of belligerence about the federal government stripping a, a right away from them, uh, they those have continued to be problems. Look, we, we've we've seen case after case, even since uh, um, the Indian Child Welfare Act uh, came into law in the seventies, where where native children were still ripped, had still been ripped away. I mean, look. The, the what Maine has uh, um, undertook with their Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission was not about residential schools per se. It, it was about foster care and adoption. And, you know, and so when you still have states that are that make the argument that there's no adequate native family or uh, you know, e within a territory that, you know, that can um, that will provide a better life for, for a child. See. You get into this debate over whether just money that that white people can provide for a child is um, is better for the child than the cultural enrichment they can get from from a native territory that may not be as affluent. You know, I one of the in the debate over this, you know, one of the the folks um, who was a part of I think the congressional hearing said, "Well, we think it's more important that a child has two sneakers rather than." dance lessons i mean that's the uh, you know that's kind of what it uh, you know as abrasive as that is to hear that for many people that's what it really comes down to what's more important a pair of shoes or you know or some cultural identity and and the fact that we still have to argue that is because the 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 issue isn't resolved through iqua the, the, in fact the the issue is, you know ends up still being a battle that many territories have over trying to retain um, custody and placement of our, of our children. Yeah, and, and another act that I wanted to talk to, talk about um, um, is can you tell us about the Violence Against Women that, Women's Act, the VAWA, and how, it is it apply, how it's applied to indigenous communities? You know, actually VAWA doesn't really uh, um, apply to us much. And I and I won't say that has no um, native implication, and because it does. I mean, it, it's a it, it's supposed to have pri provided more funding, um, you know, to to combat some of the missing and murdered indigenous women's issues that we face. But see again, what VAWA attempted to do uh, as really more along the lines of a pilot program was to recognize some territories that had tribal police tribal courts and perhaps even you know tribal jails um and through the federal government provide um the uh, enough autonomy to say we're going to grant that this territory can prosecute white men see here's the problem you know between 70 and 90 percent of the crimes committed against native women are committed by uh, by non-native people and because of laws that, that go back a number of years or, or actually Supreme Court rulings, um, it was determined that native people, native courts, native police could not prosecute white people for crimes committed against their, uh, against their people. And because of the, the lack of resources, especially in some of these more remote areas, I'm look, I mean, if you want to call a state police officer in someplace like Montana, you better, 
I mean, it's it's gonna take hours for no. There's no you know state police cruiser that's gonna show up in a few minutes, like in New York or in California or something like that. Um, and and the the resources that, uh, that are made available from a, from the FBI standpoint, because much of many times the jurisdiction over native territory still rests primarily, as far as they're concerned, <laughs> with the federal government. The FBI doesn't isn't gonna dedicate a tremendous amount of resources to you know to policing or providing safety for for native people in these remote areas so when you strip that away from tribal police and look I, I, you know like i'm gonna tell you right now i'm not crazy about us creating police forces that are just like the outside police forces just with you know a native logo on the badge or on the patch on the shirt i think that provide you know i think recognize that we have the right to to determine justice in our by our own standards and, and oftentimes what we would call restorative justice um, is, is really the, the ultimate goal, but that's not the way VAWA um, acted. VAWA said, well, if we see, if we see a court system that we think meets our standards, then we may grant that that court system can prosecute native or non-native uh, um, offenders. Well, the problem is that these, this is not a widely or a wide based program. This is very narrow. And and even then, it is still not a recognition of our sovereignty. It is a recognition that they have the power to grant some of that jurisdiction, criminal criminal jurisdiction. But it's not telling the 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 the, the overall public. Look, when you enter into a native territory, you have left the jurisdiction of of the, the county and the state, and even the federal government, and you've entered the jurisdiction of native people. No, they they never say that. See, and here's one of the things that that I think is important to to point out. Many of these laws that 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 name us specifically are really the epitome of what what you know what what people are calling critical race theory. You know, it, it oftentimes is misinterpreted. But what critical race theory is is the intersection of racism and law, and there are no greater examples of that. Even even when they try to do something like ICWA and and VAWA, you know that that may try to somehow correct a problem the underlying problem you know as as it related to especially for ICWA, was the fact that they passed a law called the civilization act that was specifically geared towards providing the funding and the tools to indoctrinate native children and it, it ended up being the both the authorization and the funding to create residential schools it didn't start out that way it, it had all, all kinds of other policies to assimilate native kids but when you're saying that your children are are um, are somehow mentally deficient because they still maintain um, some native identity, I mean, I, I go back to what I what I said earlier. Look, what the first thing that was done was to tell women that they were unfit, that they were incompetent. But when they stripped the children away, they also said those children were mentally deficient. In in New York State, the state had shifted the, so because they had some residential schools that were not a part of the federal program, but were specifically state funded. They initially funded through the state's education funds, but then was shifted to the, the state's board of charities, which was really geared towards mental institutions. So New York state had deemed native, chi native children, native kids as not just irredeemable, but, but mentally deficient. Those are, I mean, the idea that, that you could characterize a, and, and categorize um, a race of people as somehow substandard, some, you know, you know, subhuman, maybe even, I mean, that is the, that's the definition of, of race, of, of racism. And that guided many of the laws, frankly, and I'll, I'll, and we could bring it to current. I mean, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act is a racist law. It is based on the federal government producing a law out of thin air that says native people are incompetent and so we're going to we're going to determine what are the standards for native gaming to, uh, where native gaming can occur. And we're going to put the states in their in their business and we're going to create the regulatory framework because you know prior to a Supreme Court ruling in in 1987 uh, where the state of California tried to stop um, a, a high stakes bingo operation. We were at a con in a constant battle with the states, and and the federal government kind of 
stood back when the Supreme Court ruled in, fra- in favor of the Cabazons. All of a sudden, the federal government scrambled and said, well, we need to put a law in place that's going to empower the states because we don't have any framework for, for any kind of statutory laws asso- associated with native gaming. So they created one out of thin air, which really only served to strip us of the right to do to do gaming on our territories. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a whole topic that I hope to have you back because I know Seneca Nation uh, is is going through their own trials and tribulations. So I, I do want to talk to you about that um, um, in, in the future. I think we could dedicate a whole episode to that yeah. topic. Yeah. Um, and, and I and I want to talk to you about Deb Holland. And maybe that we'll have an episode about those two topics. Um, but an, another thing I wanted to ask you about today was um, last month we had Dr. Islam on the show who spoke about Bangladesh's liberation movement and how the language movement was a critical aspect of their struggle. Um, and similarly, Malcolm X often spoke about the importance of language and how one's uh, mother tongue is, uh, and about mother tongue and how it's, con- its connection to one's roots and one's history. Um, and and Malcolm, uh, Malcolm X had a speech on January 24th, 1964. Um, the title of the speech for, for the audience that might want to look it up is, it's called Afro-American history. Um, and in the speech, he, he discussed how taking away enslaved Africans' language was an in, intentional tool of the enslavers um, and you know, to, to essentially another form of genocide um, to, to take away their history, their roots. Um, and I was, what has been the US's historic and continued com, um, complicity in the extinction of indigenous languages in the Americas? Well, I, th- that part of the the first thing the residential schools did was strip language away. I mean, children were forbidden to speak their language. Um, there were active campaigns, and the Interior Department, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, w- was complicit in all of this to destroy native languages. It was only when the military decided that languages could be used for their codes, um, you know, for for the transmission of you know of, of military data, that. They, they were literally grabbing native people to say uh, and trying to enlist them. And oftentimes they would, uh, you know, charge them with a crime and then they, well, we can, you can either go to jail or you can, or you can become a code talker. So code talkers, which, you know, and a lot of times people think that it's just, this was Navajo, but there were several, you know, and uh, almost, I don't know if there were a dozen, but there were, but there were several languages that were used uh, for military codes. But see, those weren't um, even that usage. Even the militarization of our of our languages for purposes was not geared towards the preservation. In fact, the fewer people who spoke our languages, the the more secure those codes were. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you get into this the not only the the, uh, ex, the elimination and the extermination of language, but then then the exploitation of it for military mm-hmm. purposes. And and you know, to Malcolm X's point, language is. It, it's not just about history. It's about philosophy because hmm. when you look, language isn't just about labels. It isn't you know, calling a chair a chair. You know, when you delve into languages, especially languages that are so completely um, different in terms of how they're based. I mean, many native languages are not noun based languages. They are actually based on description uh, of action or appearance and, and that kind of stuff. So, you, when you have a language that 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 is it enriches the you know how you even view things i mean and how you communicate and not not just what words you mean what this word means or that word means but when i mean one of the the words that we have that we that, that many people will say that we use for for rain is the the word is yogonoru and this is uh that's moha and what yoga noro really translates to is that we know it's precious. It's, mm. it's not water falling from the sky. It, it's not. It's not noun based. It's acknowledging what that rain is to us, you know, and and how we view that rain. So it changes so much. And and again, it it, it lets us know what our ancestors, how our ancestors viewed something. Because as long as we continue to understand the etymology of a word. Then, then we understand not just where the word comes from, but how our ancestors viewed the world around us to, to, to develop these languages. And when you cut that, 
you you take away a significant part of um, of our identity. And you know, and again, if you if one when you when you strip away language, it is part of of an ethnic cleansing because ethnicity is not race. Ethnicity is tied to belief systems. So if you strip away language, that is a part of ethnic cleansing. Mm. And, and speaking of language, um, what is the international decade of indigenous languages and what has the U.S.'s response been to it? I, I think it's actually under UNESCO, but but the, the international decade of the indigenous language is about language preservation of indigenous languages. I mean, it's about creating an international effort and you know and getting the member states in, in involved in this to do everything to, to not just cease the eradication of language but to develop programs or to or to provide the support for existing programs that native people many of us are, already have in place but the united states wouldn't sign on to this thing the united states you know in part because look i i think because of the role the united states played in, in the eradication of language. And look, we lost many native languages. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that, that Mohawk language and Seneca language and some of the Haudenosaunee languages have been preserved, but many languages, I mean, you look, you, the United States recognizes like, I don't know, 575 federally recognized tribes, you know, and, and that, whatever that means, I mean, is not necessary, doesn't necessarily correspond to all of the distinct cultures that existed as far as indigenous people in the U.S. and, and, and what is now the, considered the U.S. and Canada. We had many languages, and, and, and in, within those languages, there were dialects that were sometimes um, you know, different enough that, that it would take extra effort to, to connect even the, the dialectical changes from, from a language. So, I mean, trying to, the United States' role in, in the eradication of native languages is was was so profound that it almost doesn't surprise me that the United States has backed away from uh, endorsing an international effort to um, to restore indigenous languages. Uh, you know, because you know, there's a, there's a guilt. I mean, look, part of the, I mentioned the, the the expression critical race theory. Part of the the biggest fight uh, across you know the United States and and several states have banned the idea of critical race theory even being taught in schools, even though it never was, because they believe that it produces white guilt. Hmm. If you teach real history. Well, if you confront, you know, the, the, the indigenous language issue in the United States, there is rightfully some guilt that uh, that governments, you know, uh, institutions like churches, because they played a big role in this, but certainly, you know, uh, the school systems and not just the public school system, the university systems. I mean, there, I mean, there, there aren't, there's, there are complete absences of, of, you know, of any acknowledgement about the value of native languages. Because look, it isn't just, oh, isn't that quaint that they, they, they have a different tongue. There's, I maintain that there's value in those languages that, uh, that are, are not recognized. They aren't recognized by, by Ivy League schools, by grade schools, by government. By you know, by religious religious organizations, quite to the contrary, they've actually been worked against. Mm. Well, um, those are all the questions I have for you for today. Um, and I do hope to have you back to talk about some additional topics. But is there anything you wanted to say today before before we finish? Well, I also think you know education is is such a big component of this thing, and one of the things that I'm also very prominently involved in is uh, is trying to stop schools from using native mascots mm -hmm. and uh, look we saw the washington football team and the uh cleveland baseball team you know drop its you know cartoonish logos and and, uh, and their their racial slur names that they use but you know the it's a bigger problem for schools i mean to me schools using native mascots is worse than professional teams using it because those schools are supposed to teach children mm -hmm. and teaching children is that this is what an indian is or this is what a warrior is. And so we're being cast as relics of the past and we're being cast with characteristics that aren't necessarily accurate. They, they, aren't, they don't accurately describe who we are as a people. I mean, look, we're always, we're always uh, you know, projected as, as warriors, as, as warlike and violent. And, uh, you know, and, you know, look, they try to 
put some positive characteristics to that, like bravery and, you know, noble, the noble savage, that kind of stuff. But they don't necessarily accurately reflect who we are, either through the imagery or their characterization. So that's something else that, that I'm very prominent, uh, prominently involved in, you know, as well as, you know, I, frankly, as well as all of the battles that we, we continue, environmental, social, educational issues that, 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 that Native people have to confront. Yeah, and, and the Washington football team, they changed their name to some militarized name. What is it, like the Washington Commanders or something? It's just uh, like... And, 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 you know, look, I thought you have a team of commanders. I mean, is it a <laughs> singular position, one that leads the other? I mean, it would have made more sense to call themselves commandos, I guess, if they're going to try to say that they are a team of something. But, no, it doesn't make sense. And, and frankly, it's, 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 not a, it's not a name that is being embraced very well. But, you know... Funny thing about, you know, about sports, you know, it has a tendency to, people can get grow used to things really easy, especially if they, look, if the, if the team was ever worth, uh, worth a damn, if they could win a few games, they, they you know, <laughs> people would, would fall in love with them all over again, I suppose, because that's the nature of, you know, of, of American, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a true pleasure and I hope to have you back uh, again soon.